Welcome to the Kentucky Forestry and Wildlife Assistance webinar. We're really excited to have you all with us. I've got a great group of um, presenters that's going to be joining us here in a little bit, um, and I'll introduce them as we get along. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you all for being here with us. I'd also like to thank the county extension agents who are out there hosting this. Um, a big thanks to each of you all for being with us. If you all been with us um, throughout this series, I certainly appreciate that. This is the fifth and a um, five-part series, so we'll be wrapping up our forestry webinar series here um, with this evening's program. I'll tell you a little bit more about the um, other webinars in just a second, um, but I do want to point out that you should have a packet of material for tonight's webinar. Um, your county agents um, should have those packets for you, and there should be an evaluation in there. As well, if you're a master logger, you can get master logger credit for tonight's program. You can get one and a half hours for it. I would just ask that um, you please complete those master logger forms and the evaluations and return those to your county extension agent um, with a big thanks for um, uh, opening up their office for this. All right, so as we've been doing for the last um, webinars in this series, we wanted to start with a few opening statements, and you should have those opening statements with you, but I'm going to put them up on the screen and then we're going to take about a three minute break and then we'll come back and talk about those a little bit and um, I'll review a little bit more content. So I'm going to go ahead and pull that up right now and then we'll give you about three minutes to discuss it. And what I'd like for you all to do is discuss it in the room um, and kind of think about these points that we've got on the screen uh, here in a second and, um, and if you've got any questions or comments on them please get them to your agents in the chat box. Okay, hopefully you've had a chance to think about these questions for a minute. And I will tell you, I felt a little bad when I sent these questions to you all or, or comments, especially this first one, because actually this first one is actually false. Um, it turns out that you do not have to plant trees here in Kentucky typically after a timber harvest. In fact, planting trees um, after a timber harvest in a forested area can be a challenge. Not that it can't be done, but it does take an extra bit of work and um, some forethought in doing so. So, you know, one great thing about the forest we have here in Kentucky as compared to some other places is they really will naturally regenerate. Um, what we try to do though is we try to manage and we try to pick the species that we want to be successful. So while the trees may grow up on their own, you may not end up with the species that you're necessarily interested in. So again, you don't have to replant after a timber harvest, but you do need to think about what's going to come up and doing practices that will help that. And we'll have um, Pam Snyder on here in a minute talking about the Kentucky Division of Forestry and how foresters can come out and help, help you through some of this stuff. The next one, do you have ash trees on your property? Um, so any comment, let me see, I was trying to pull up the chat pod real quick here and see if there was any comments in the chat pod. Um, and I'm not able to see the chat pod right now, so hopefully there's not. Um, but if you do have ash trees on your property, it's certainly a concern. Um, the emerald ash borer, or EAB, is an insect, an invasive insect that is wreaking havoc on our ash trees throughout Kentucky and really throughout the eastern United States and really wherever it's found. It's really caused us a lot of problems. Um, Ellen Crocker will be talking about that in a little bit. We're going to have Dr. Ellen Crocker coming up first um, after we get through this little intro part. But um, certainly if you have ash trees on your property, you need to know what you're going to be doing with them. You need to be thinking about that a little bit if you've not already had to deal with that. Uh, I know some of our folks in northern Kentucky have already kind of gone through this, but some in some other areas it may just now be getting to you. So um, we'll talk a little bit about what you can do with that. Another program we're going to be talking about tonight is the Natural Resources Conservation Service Programs, and that's NRCS. Um, Randall Alcorn is going to be talking a little bit about that here in a while, um, but the point is, is some people think if you work through this program, which is a federal government program, that it opens your property up 
to the public. And that's not the case. Um, so you can still work with them and still maintain your property without having to open it up to the public. So don't let that be a discouragement. That's a rumor that we hear. And finally, which non-governmental organizations are available to support Kentucky Woodland owners? And one of the things we're trying to do with this webinar this evening is to highlight to each of you all the groups that are out there that can help you. Um, and two really important ones that are non-governmental organizations are the American Tree Farm organizations, are the American Tree Farm system. And here in Kentucky, we operate that as the Kentucky Tree Farm Program. And the other group is the Kentucky Woodland Owners Association. That's a um, volunteer organization, a private group of woodland owners here in Kentucky that are really working hard on behalf of woodland owners in the state. Um, it's a really good organization. And we're fortunate to have the chairman of the American Tree Farm System here in Kentucky, as well as the president of the Kentucky Woodland Owners Association. And it all happens to be the same person, uh, Mr. Doug McLaren. So we're gonna hear from Doug toward the end of the, um, evening and then we'll talk about some of these other kind of non-governmental agencies that are out there and available. Um, but let's go ahead and um, talk about who we're going to have with us tonight. I have, um, I, you have me right now, Billy Thomas. I'm an extension forester at the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources here at the University of Kentucky. And we're coming to you live from Lexington, Kentucky right now. And I also have Ellen Crocker. Dr. Ellen Crocker is our forest health specialist. Um, she's a, an extension professor here in our department. And she's going to be coming in with us remotely. Um, she's at a, um, a field station doing some work there. There, but she was able to kind of log in um, and we're hoping her sound and everything works great with that um, but, we'll, but we'll do our best with that and we're really glad to have Ellen with us so Ellen you're gonna be on deck here in a second um, so consider this your couple minute warning um, next I'm gonna have um, Pam Snyder um, she's with the hey Ellen um, with the Kentucky Division of Forestry and she's gonna be talking about their services and programs that they have available and then again Mr. Randall Alcorn um, Randall is a wildlife biologist by training but he has kind of a unique position here in Kentucky. He's um, partially employed by the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources, as well as the Kentucky Natural Resources Conservation Service. So um, we're really glad to have Randall. He's an outstanding biologist and a good guy, and I've had a chance to work with him a lot out in the field, and he's really good with landowners. So if he's in your area, um, consider yourself lucky. And then finally, as I mentioned, uh, Mr. Doug McLaren. Um, Doug is the president of the Kentucky Woodland Owners Association, as well as the chairman of the Kentucky Tree Farm Program. So you're going to hear from all of these great speakers. I'm going to try to moderate it the best I can and keep us on track. Um, but real quick, before I turn it over to Ellen, I want to hit one more um, kind of reminder that this is the fifth in a five-part series. And we started out this series way back at the beginning of February, where we were talking about woodland management, what is right for you and your woodland. Um, if you missed this webinar, here is a link that you can um, view it at. You will have to do a small little registration to be able to see that, but it is open to the public at this point. Um, if you are a master logger and you're trying to get credit for past webinars, you have to watch those at your county extension office. They have to be proctored by your county extension agent in order for you to get credit. Um, so I just want to make that clear. Um, so on, on that webinar, we were talking about what is right for you and your woodlands. You know, wh what type of management is good for you? Then we switched over to the financial aspects of woodland management. We really talked about some of the economics of it, some of the real hardcore decisions that you might have to make as you're thinking about making investments in your property and how to go about that. And again, all of these webinars are archived and available. Then we talked about non-timber forest products, and we've certainly got some here in Kentucky as well. Um, and we've got some information on our website at ukforestry.org about those as well. Um, so a, a, a number of opportunities for you to generate revenue and enjoyment and some products from your property without harvesting timber. And then we, um, last week, we talked about really family ownership and keeping it intact, how to keep that woodland um, together and how to pass it on to future generations that are interested in managing it. So if you've missed any of those webinars, I'd really encourage you to go back and watch them. If you have any trouble with that, your county extension agent should be able to help you navigate that process. Um, and if, you, if you're unable there, just um, give us a holler at ukforestry.org and we will um, do our best to try to make sure that you can see those webinars. So again, thank you all for being with with us. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Ellen Crocker. I'm going to stop my screen share um, so that she can do her screen share. And Ellen, we are so glad to have you and I hope um, your trip's going well and, and thanks for coming in remotely. 
Well, thanks for having me, and I hope everyone can hear me okay. Uh, as Billy mentioned, you know, if I drop out, it's it's uh, because I'm at a remote location, but I, it's my pleasure to be here with you tonight. Um, and I just want to thank all of you for coming and being here uh, to talk about these really important issues and what you can be doing. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Hopefully everyone can see this. Um, if not, uh, give me a holler and let me know. Uh, so as uh, Billy mentioned, I'm a forest health extension specialist. And uh, kind of one of the first questions that goes along with that is what is forest health and why should I care about it? Um, so there are a lot of different definitions for forest health and what it looks like depends on where you are and what your management objectives are. Uh, so, you know, are you trying to maximize timber? Are you trying to have uh, the most healthy um, uh, old growth forest that you want in the future, you know, legacy for your family? Do you want non-timber forest products? And um, as Billy mentioned earlier, you know, as far as states go, Kentucky is in a great place because we have a lot of positives in terms of forest health. We have great diversity. We have these naturally regenerating forests that grow on their own. They don't need us to plant them. Uh, the trees grow really well. Um, so we've got a lot of uh, checks in our favor, um, but we also have threats that are out there uh, that are good to have on your radar because whatever your management objectives are, they can really throw you for a loop. Uh, so Today, I just want to cover, you know, what are some of those threats that are out there? Just a couple of them uh, and kind of set the stage for some of our speakers that will be coming up as far as what you can do about them and how they can help. Uh, so here in Kentucky, we've got a few major forest health issues. Um, we do have current invasive species that are causing problems. So things like insects and diseases that can kill trees. And I'm going to talk about a couple of those. Those can really change your woodlands um, by removing species that used to be there, as well as, you know, killing, depending on uh, your woodland composition, a good number of the trees. Uh, so that could be something that's going to require some management to deal with. Uh, similarly, we have a lot of invasive plants. Now, while these plants typically aren't going to kill your trees, they can really change the dynamics of your forest. And let's say you have a lot of invasive plants when what you want to have is a lot of, uh, you know, seedlings and saplings growing up, uh, becoming those next uh, big trees in your, your woodlands, uh, that can really get in the way of things. Uh, so management of those species is very key. And then we've got a lot of invasives nearby that it's good to keep an eye out for. We might not have them right now, but the sooner you can spot them, uh, the sooner you can stop them and actually do something about that. Um, we've got other issues that pop up from time to time. This photo here that I've included is of the drought that we had this past uh, summer and fall. Um, you know, that's one of the most extreme droughts we've had in this area. And while uh, some of the other issues that I mentioned, these invasive insects and diseases, uh, they have a capacity to completely change things. Uh, I like to think that in general, our, our trees, our woodlands are uh, doing well and have the capacity to bounce back from a lot of these other issues, you know, native insects or diseases that might look bad, but not cause big problems long term. So one of the things I wanna emphasize is that one of the best things you can do for the health of your woodlands in general is just to promote good uh, tree and forest health. So a lot of the same practices that we talk about uh, from a management uh, perspective, uh, from a timber sand improvement perspective, might also improve the health of your woodland. Uh, so just something that goes hand in hand. So one of the major issues that we're dealing with right now in the state is the emerald ash borer. Uh, here you can see some photos of what this insect looks like. Um, if you're into beetles, it's, it's kind of a pretty beetle. It's an emerald color. Um, and they're, they're small, they're, they're really not that big. Uh, but the beetle itself doesn't hurt the tree. What hurts the tree are its larvae. Uh, so the beetle lays its eggs on, on ash trees. And it's really all of our native ash species that we have here, as well as white fringe tree. Uh, so the beetle lays its eggs, the larvae hatch, and they tunnel just underneath the bark of the tree. 
Uh, now this doesn't actually hurt the wood itself, but it's certainly enough to kill the tree. It cuts off the circulation of the tree because there are so many larvae that are tunneling in there. And in this picture right here, you can kind of see that, uh, you know, this, this tunnels, these really kind of wiggly tunnels underneath. And what you end up with are dead ash trees. So our ash um, are being wiped out by the emerald ash borer. Mortality is really, really high. Um, and what are the first things that you'd notice? Now, uh, depending on where you are, you might have been dealing with this for a long time. And I'm showing you pictures of, you know, a nemesis that you've, you've been dealing with for longer than you'd like. Um, but the first things you'd probably notice are dead branches, maybe the thinning, thinning crown of the tree. Uh, it just doesn't look good. And unfortunately, by the time that's happening, things are probably pretty advanced because that beetle has been in the tree. Uh, its larvae have been tumbling around and cutting off the circulation, basically strangling the tree, uh, which is what's, what's killing it. And then if you look closer, you might see these little D-shaped exit holes. Those are where the adults emerge. So by the time that's happened, there's already been larvae tunneling in the tree, causing this damage that you see in this photo. And then um, if you're kind of in our area, in northern Kentucky, central Kentucky, what you probably see a lot of are these trees with the bark flaking off, maybe snapping in half. Ash tends to kind of snap in half because even though the emerald ash borer itself doesn't hurt the wood, um, the second the tree starts to die, um, a lot of other insects and fungi will move in. Uh, so a lot of um, secondary issues will affect the integrity of that tree, cause it to break in half. Um, the flaking you're seeing here is because of wildlife trying to get at those larvae that are under the bark. Uh, so a lot of issues and a real potential hazard if you have a lot of ash in your woodland um, to have these standing dead trees that are really prone to fall apart rapidly, snap in half, drop branches. Um, so where are we with emerald ash borer in the state right now? Right now it's about halfway through the state. So if you are a county in green uh, or, or blue, it's already known to occur there. Uh, if you're in the western part of the state here, um, maybe not yet, uh, but it is on the way to you. And I think kind of a more telling uh, map would be this one right here. Uh, so this is a map, Kentucky Division of Forestry, uh, aerially flies the state to see exactly how much damage is there to ash. So it's one thing to say that the emerald ash borer is there and it's causing damage. Um, a total other issue to say, you know, how, how much ash mortality is there. So if you look at this little map down here, that's where ash was before the arrival of emerald ash borer. So you can kind of guess that in areas that kind of are white in color or light color, um, you know, it's not gonna be that big of a deal compared to those areas that are a darker green. That's a lot of ash. You know, we have areas uh, with 20, 25, 30% ash. The impact of emerald ash borer is gonna be much higher. Um, if you look at this map right here, uh, the red shows you where ash mortality is really common. And if you're in a lot of these areas, um, pretty much all of the ash trees are uh, dead or well on their way. If you're in a yellow area, it means there is some ash mortality, but it's not complete. And if you're in this kind of gray area, it means you don't really see widespread any, any ash mortality yet, but it's probably headed your way soon. So this is important because it really impacts what your management options are uh, going forward. So both in terms of how much ash do you have or did you have to begin with, um, it's gonna tell you how big of an impact emerald ash borer is gonna have for you, but also where are you? Um, what's the state of your ash right now? Uh, do you have the ability to do a harvest and um, get ahead of this? Or if these are small number of trees, maybe in a landscape or high value setting to treat with an insecticide, or is it too late for that? Are we looking at kind of um, triaging what's left in your woodlands, a lot of standing dead ash that are a potential hazard? And so I think where a lot of people are right now is, you know, they, they either they have the emerald ash form, they have a lot of dead ash trees, or they know that they're coming. And now they're wondering, okay, now what do I do? Um, what do what, how do I handle this situation? And um, I think it really depends on the context that we're talking about. Obviously, this is gonna be super different if you're talking about a few trees um, in a, a, a street a lining a city because ash was really, really commonly planted um, versus a woodland setting. And so I think that's something that, that 
we all consider. Uh, but in that woodland setting, uh, the key is going to be laying the foundation for success post emerald ash borer. So while we can't stop emerald ash borer and uh, you know, we know it's coming, we know it's going to be a problem. What we can do is lay the foundation for a great future afterwards because we've got lots of great native trees that would take its place and kind of a form of vibrant, uh, healthy, valuable woodland afterwards um, if we just help them along and identify any roadblocks in the way of that happening and address them. Um, some of those can be invasive plant species that I'll talk about in a second um, because what you want to see is your great native plants, um, na great native trees coming up, those seedlings growing taller, um, those saplings growing into the overstory. What you don't want to see is a whole bunch inv of invasive plants clogging everything up and preventing those natural processes from occurring. Uh, so just a little bit of information on emerald ash borer and what's going on with that. Another major issue that we have in the state is hemlock woolly adelgid, another invasive insect. And here you can see a photo of an area where those trees, uh, hemlock trees, have just been decimated by this invasive insect from Asia. And here's kind of a photo of what that might look like uh, some of the year when you have uh, those insect egg masses. Um, what they're doing is that insect is actually on the needles, sucking all the nutrients out of the tree, and it actually injects the toxin into that tree too that makes those needles dry up and prevents the growth of that tree, killing it over time. Uh, so this is a really important issue in a lot of, uh, you know, wherever hemlock is located in our state, um, especially because a lot of where hemlock is located is a pretty sensitive habitat with lots of, uh, you know, other things that depend on hemlock. So maybe streams with amphibians or invertebrates in them that, you know, really need the conditions that hemlock creates. And without hemlock, you can get some big changes. So here's a map of where that hemlock woolly adelgid insect is right now. Um, and you can see it's pretty much all through our state, um, all across the range. There's a few pockets here and there where it hasn't been detected yet, but obviously, you know, that's just a, a matter of time and it's pretty close. So if you have a lot of hemlock, this is something to be considering and thinking about. Um, hemlock mortality right now is pretty sporadic. So you get patches where there's really high mortality. And again, you know, this is gonna be restricted to uh, this part of the state, uh, so not something everyone has to consider, but uh, would be really important uh, if you have a lot of hemlock. There are insecticide treatment options out there, and there are some biological controls and trials that are actually uh, predators of that invasive insect, and the hope is that long term will help keep its population uh, in check. Um, so just a couple kind of major invasive issues to have on your radar. Now we are looking to see if we can find some trees that are resistant to ash and hemlock as part of the research that we're doing in partnership with Kentucky Division of Forestry and others. And if you happen to see any, we'd love to know. We've got an app called TreeSnap um, for you to report those on, uh, treesnap.org. Um, and we'd love to know those locations so we can get those healthy trees back out on the landscape. Now this year, for the first time, we have a brand new invasive that I'm just going to briefly mention uh, called Laurel Wilt Disease of Sassafras. This is a disease that kills sassafras and spicebush. Now you might not care as much about sassafras and spicebush because they're not uh, marketable timber species, but just another example of these invasive organisms coming in and really changing our forests. So right now we've had a little detection down here in southwestern Kentucky and Tennessee and northwestern Tennessee, but as you can see, in Tennessee, they also detected it in the eastern part of the state. So it's possible that it's kind of more widespread. And, and I'd love to know if you happen to notice a sassafras decline, um, where it is so that we can be more effective about stopping it. So this disease is a fungus carried by a tiny beetle. It's invasive um, and it's kind of moved into this area from the uh, coastal uh, part of the US where it was on a different plant. And so here it's on sassafras and spicebush. So what would you look for? You'd look for sassafras or spicebush that's um, dying. Maybe if it, once it has leaves on, that it has kind of looks like it's fall early. You know, it's got that fall leaf color really early in the season or just a bunch of dead twigs. And then if you kind of chip into the bark of that with a hatchet or something, what you'd see is this real dark black streaky staining. Now that's the fungus that's killing the tree. It's cutting off its circulation. Um, and so that's kind of a surefire way to see it. Now, 
it's being moved around by these tiny little beetles that move the fungus from tree to tree. But I'll tell you, the, the real way it's going to be moved around is by us accidentally moving it around in contaminated firewood or other materials. So just something to consider uh, look going forward this year as things start to leaf out. Keep an eye out for that, but also a really good example of why we shouldn't be moving uh, firewood too long distances, you know, some of the dangers associated with that. So I just want to mention some invasive plants before I turn it over uh, to some great resources for you. We have lots of invasive plants and they can get in the, way, in the way of your management in a lot of different ways. So it could be that these are invasive trees that are you know, taking the place of larger trees that you want to see, your native valuable trees. Um, or these could be shrubs or herbaceous species that kind of prevent those small trees from growing into those big trees. So we have invasive trees like princess tree, tree of heaven, mimosa, or calorie pear, a lot of that right now, and it's just getting ready to flower, so a good time to look for it. We have invasive shrubs like multiflora rose, autumn olive, bush honeysuckle. If you're in central Kentucky, I am sure that is a familiar face. Um, we have invasive vines like kudzu, winter creeper, Japanese honeysuckle, and then grasses and herbaceous species like miscanthus or Chinese silvergrass, Japanese stiltgrass, and of course garlic mustard. So this picture kind of exemplifies some of the problems associated with those where if you have a dense, dense stand of these invasive, nothing else can get through there. You don't have the biodiversity, the, the native species thriving that you want to see, uh, whether it's kind of wildflowers or the, the tree species. So just some examples of this. And one more, lesser celandine. It's getting ready to flower right now, so a good time to look for it. Um, so we have tons of these. We could go on and on and on about invasive species and um, the different ones to look for. Uh, but what I'm going to kind of say is that coming up in the rest of this webinar, you've got fantastic resources um, talking to you that would be great uh, for all of these different aspects of forest health. Um, Kentucky Division of Forestry, Kentucky Department of uh, Fish and Wildlife, Kentucky uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service, and then of course your local cooperative extension offices. Um, whether you're talking about invasive species, invasive plants and their management, or what to do about emerald ash borer, uh, these resources are great places to go for information on what do you have, what do you do about it? And then how can you uh, offset some of the costs associated with those? In addition, I just want to mention our website, uh, uh, Forest, Forestry's Extension's website. We have some resources related to forest health threats. And then the Kentucky Forest Health Facebook page um, at KY Forest Health. Uh, we try to put a lot of information there about new things that are coming up and things to look for. Um, so with that, I want to go ahead and uh, stop sharing my screen and uh, turn it over to our, our next speaker. So I see uh, Billy there and Pam Snyder. Um, you couldn't ask for uh, better resources than Kentucky Division of Forestry. Uh, so um, uh, appreciate talking with all of you tonight. Thanks for having me. Ellen, thank you so much. Um, folks, I will ask you real quick, um, Ellen's gonna have to go again, she's at a remote site. So if you have any questions for Dr. Crocker right now, um, is your kind of one and only for tonight, but obviously Ellen, we can get you questions later if they've got them. Um, but if somebody's got a burning question for Dr. Crocker, um, you have a moment or two to get it in right now. Um, she's gonna have to depart. She's actually attending a conference right now and she's taking some time out of her schedule to be with us. So. Um, and you're also welcome to email me, uh, get in touch with me through uh, Billy or, or anyone else um, if you have questions that come up. All right, Ellen, thank you, really appreciate you. So again, if you all do have some forest health related questions, you can hit us up with those. And um, if we can't answer them and we've got some other experts here, um, then we will get them to Dr. Crocker. And again, Ellen, thanks again for being with us and um, being part of the show. All right, so folks, I've got with me in studio now, Ms. Pam Snyder. Um, Pam is with the Kentucky Division of Forestry. And um, you know, Pam, I really appreciate you being with us tonight. You are welcome. Yeah. Completely. All right, so Pam is the forest management chief. So she's kind of in charge of um, the forest management for the Division of Forestry as far as overseeing and supporting the foresters that are out there in the state. Um, Pam's very knowledgeable about the Division of Forestry and a great partner um, for all in forestry here in Kentucky. So Pam, thanks for all you do. I um, really appreciate it. And without any further ado, I'm going to try to pull up your um, PowerPoint real quick and um, turn it over to you. Good evening, folks. Um, the Division 
is our mission is to protect, conserve, and enhance the forest resources of the Commonwealth of Kentucky through a public informed of the environmental, social, and economic importance of these resources. I've been with the division for a little over 24 years and we have six regional offices across the state. Um, all you have to do is Google Kentucky Division of Forestry and you'll be able to contact any of those offices. What does forestry actually do? We do a lot of different things. Um, Kentucky itself is about 48% forested, um, mostly oak hickory dominated forest, some pine. Also our ownership ranges from 88% privately owned to other entities being the national forest, other federal lands and state and local lands. The main program that I really oversee is the Forest Stewardship Program and it is free to all private owners who own forest land that want to produce quality timber, improve wildlife habitat, um, also clean water and want to take advantage of scenic beauties and utilize their lands as recreational potential for their forest lands. But really what we're looking for is landowners that want to believe in their responsibility to take care of the land in such a way that future generations may have all the land's benefits to use and enjoy. We have several different cost share programs. I'm not going to get into real depth because we've got another presenter. Um, we have the con conservation reserve program, which is through the Farm Service Agency. We also have the environmental quality incentives program um, that is offered through the Natural Resource Conservation Service. And then there is the state cost share program, which is offered through the Kentucky Division of Conservation. It's called the Kentucky Soil and Water Conservation Program. The division, as I said, has other programs. We have a forest health program that works very closely with Dr. Ellen Crocker. Um, we have an urban and community community forestry program. We have a wildland fire management. Um, we also have two state nurseries um, that sells tree seedlings. We also have 10 different Kentucky state forests that we manage. We also have the forest inventory analysis program, which that program in itself provides a lot of economic reports and information back on Kentucky's forest. We have the Master Logger Program, the Forest Utilization Program, and other educational programs like Envirothon and the Forest Leadership Program that we do with the University of Kentucky. And there's time for questions. Okay. Yeah, if there's some quick questions, we can take those right now. Um, otherwise, we'll probably hold questions for the end. But if somebody's got a burning question for Pam, we can go ahead and try to address that now. Okay. All right. So we're going to go ahead and bring in um, Mr. Randall Alcorn. All right, Randall, I'm glad to have you with us today. Oh, yeah, I'd rather be here. I really appreciate it. So again, um, I introduced him a little bit earlier. Um, and Randall, it looks like I need to get some more um, <laughs> of, of seating under me there. But um, anyway, I'm glad to have you. Like I said, folks, Randall is a wildlife biologist with the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources. Also has a joint position with the Kentucky Natural Resources Conservation Service. Um, a great wildlife biologist, all around good guy. So Randall, we're glad to have you with us and um, sharing some of your knowledge and some of the information about how your groups can really support woodland owners here in Kentucky. Yeah. That's, that's correct. Yep. Um, so like Billy said, I'm with the uh, Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife, but I'm also a uh, liaison with the Natural Resource Conservation Service. Uh, so pretty much fish and wildlife, um, you know, we're kind of known as, as doing like open lands management, uh, but we can also help with uh, forest management too if, if you're uh, wanting to manage your forest for wildlife. 
um, some of the things we do is we offer a, a free service to do a technical guidance business to your property. Essentially, we'll come out, we'll hear what your goals are for the property, and then we'll uh, write a plan up to help you manage your goals and reach those goals um, that you want. Um, that plan can be short term or it can be a long term plan. We can try to make that plan at, you know, out to five to 10 years. Um, and then we can help you manage for a specific species. You know, if you want to manage for grouse, that's a little bit different than managing for deer. Um, and then some other things we can do is we can provide uh, habitat how to's, which these are uh, essentially uh, instructional guides to help you implement some of the practices we recommend. Um, and then we can also go as far as helping demonstrate these and make sure you got the concept down because we want to make sure that you understand what you're doing and why you're doing it. So that's why we're, we're always willing to help you. Um, as far as a plan, this is kind of an example of a plan we might put together for you as a landowner. Uh, we'll come out, uh, we'll go around the property, we'll look at as much as you want to show us. Uh, once we get that um, the, the, out the boundary of your property, uh, we can then start critique and practices to help uh, better enhance your property. So in this case, you know, we've planned some patch clear cuts, some edge feathering, and then just some spraying and some fields to try to get some more native species to come back. Uh, but this is an example of some kind of plans we can give you. And then there'll also be a written plan that it kind of give you step by step on what kind of, uh, what you need to do to implement these practices. Uh, so now I'm just going to kind of talk about some of the practices we can do in forestry to kind of get you thinking about um, for wildlife management. So we all know um, that wildlife need three things for their home range, and that's food, water, and, and cover, cover. And usually cover is a limiting factor because uh, everybody generally likes to keep things looking neat. They don't want to see the scruffy stuff, but the cover is really what keeps the wildlife on your property. Uh, so when we start talking about management practices for wildlife, uh, one of those is called forest stand improvement. Um, now this differs from timber stand improvement because forest stand improvement, your main objective is you're doing it for wildlife versus timber stand, you're trying to provide better timber. Uh, so with wildlife in mind, what we're trying to do is take your property from the screen on the left, which has hardly no herbaceous understory, to the screen on the right to provide more forage and browse for wildlife and, and also provide cover. So in this scenario, you can see uh, the understory is still bare. It's completely shaded out. There's no herbaceous um, cover whatsoever, no browse for wildlife. If you were to get down you know, and look underneath the trees, you could see for a pretty good distance. Uh, so what we're looking to do is take out some of the maple and some of the beech and try to punch holes in that canopy to get sunlight onto the floor. Um, and it's gonna provide a lot of uh, native species and herbaceous layers to come up and then your second goal is you also want to help that oak and hickory regeneration, which this is going to help to some extent. Other management practices that we can do for the forest are patch clear cuts and edge feathering. Patch clear cuts, of course, they get a bad name um, because they kind of look rough, but this is probably one of the most beneficial practices you can do as far as putting instant cover on the ground. Um, they can be anywhere from an acre to five acres to 10 acres, depending on what kind of species you want to manage for. Um, all species generally benefit to some extent to, to a patch clear cut. Um, as you can see, as soon as you open up that canopy, you get a flush of sunlight down, all the herbaceous uh, plants coming up, tons of browse for uh, especially deer, and then you've got cover with the tops being there. Um, one of the scenarios we see a lot, especially in Eastern Kentucky, is somebody's had their property timbered and they do what's called a high grade. They've taken all the good stuff and they've left the bad stuff. So in the cases like this, you can create some good wildlife habitat while in the meantime helping your forest by go ahead and, and removing that canopy layer, taking the rest of it off and just letting it come back, regen. And this is a year later after that cut. So you get a lot of flush um, growth coming up tons of cover, tons of forage and browse, and this is where the wildlife are gonna hang out. Uh, another good practice that, um, especially if you've got two different habitats meeting together, is called um, edge feathering. Uh, the, the general reason behind edge feathering is you wanna eliminate that hard edge. Um, so the picture on the left, you can see it's, it's a ma somewhat mature forest leading into an open field. And the reason this is bad is because 
predators tend to hang out on the edges like that because it makes for easy prey. Uh, when when animals come out on the edge, there's nothing for them for cover wise, so they get preyed upon pretty easy. So what you're trying to do is eliminate that hard edge and create what's called a soft edge. The picture on the right, uh, you can see there's we're getting three different stages of uh, of habitat. You've got a, gr a grass stage, which is great for turkey poults, quail. They can go in there and forage on insects. And then as you start moving up, you get into the shrub layer, which uh, produces a lot of soft mass and good cover. And then you start easing back into your forest transition. Um, the best way to do one of these practices is, you know, the first 10 to 15 feet, do a complete clear cut. The second 10 to 15 feet, take out about 50% of the canopy. And then your last 10 to 15 feet, you want to remove about 75%. And it would just give you three different stages of development um, for perfect habitat. And again, it offers great escape cover um, so that animals can come out into the fields and forage with knowing that they've got cover to get to if something comes after them. Uh, this is just another picture of, uh, you know, a forest meeting to an open field. We did a uh, edge feather back 40 feet. Uh, a year later, you had this nice lush soft edge that um, provides excellent habitat for, for turkey poults when they're getting uh, getting raised and uh, especially fawns too. This offers a great habitat for fawns to bed in. Uh, I know Ellen talked about earlier, but invasive species. Um, if, if somebody tells you they don't have invasive plants on their property, uh, they better not walk their property or they don't know what they're looking for because there's invasive species uh, in everybody's property. Everybody's got some kind of invasive species. Uh, mainly some of the shrubby ones are you, you got bush honeysuckle, tree of heaven, multiflora rose. Uh, the bad thing about bush honeysuckle is it takes over your forest understory. So what this does is it shades out any potential for your oak and hickory regen and also suppresses your native herbaceous plants. Um, and then you just get a continuous cycle of bush honeysuckle until you start taking management uh, steps to get rid of those. Uh, especially in the eastern part of the, or the central part of the state, you see a lot of this. Um, especially with the emerald ash borer opening up the canopies, you're going to see a lot more of it. Um, as we move out into eastern Kentucky, um, you get a lot more autumn olive groves and the picture of the plant to the forefront there is uh, multiflora rose. Uh, again, the same scenario, they, they tend to grow tightly grouped and they uh, outcompete the native species and it, it hinders your ability to regenerate your forest or just regenerate native plants that uh, wildlife tend to key on. Uh, another good practice I like to implement is uh, what we call ephemeral pools or wildlife watering holes. Uh, we typically put these on a bench or on a high ridge or on a ridge top, I'm sorry. And uh, if you put these in the, in the correct spot, um, they will hold water pretty much year round to some extent. Um, they're mainly used for amphibians and reptiles as, as breeding ground and, and places to lay eggs. But they also offer a great water source um, for upland wildlife species, you know, instead of, if they got a water source at the top of the ridge, instead of having to go all the way down to the mountain to the nearest creek or, or the nearest water source. And then we also talk about, you know, you want a lot of diversity in your habitats. Um, and one of those is you can do um, kind of a savanna type setting uh, with warm season grasses um, intertwined with your forest. Um, these are great for, uh, for turkeys and quail. Um, this one's about five acres. You don't have to be a big one, but um, as soon as you open up, you get a lot of lush native grasses that come up, um, especially Indian grass tends to um, hide out in the soil here. When you bring sunlight to it and a little disturbance, you get a lot of those native warm season grasses that have been here for centuries that'll start coming back up. If you're interested in, um, in having a, a technical guidance visit, uh, the best way to get one of those is to go to the uh, Fish and Wildlife website. Um, you click on the tab that says contact us. When you click on that tab, you'll get my, find my county contact. Um, you just select what county you're in. Um, in this county, we picked Laurel County and you can see on the right there, it gives you the conservation officer, the public lands wildlife biologist, the private lands biologist, and even the fisheries biologist. All those that service your county are there for you to either contact by phone or contact by email with any kind of habitat or management questions you might have. Uh, 
part of my other duties is I work for NRCS um, to help implement their farm bill programs. Uh, NRCS is, is mainly known for helping agriculture producers, um, but they also help people in um, enhance wildlife um, for conservation. Um, to get to the Kentucky uh, NRCS website, uh, you can just Google search Kentucky NRCS and it'll bring this page up. Uh, the second tab there is programs. It gives you a list of all the programs that are offered through NRCS. Um, the, the practices and programs we I talked about earlier are all offered underneath the NRCS wildlife uh, fund code, which covers the entire state. And even um, there is a forestry fund code um, that Kentucky Division of Forestry kind of helped in some implements and that runs the entire state as well. So if you get a, a stewardship plan written by a KDF official, you can uh, have some of those practices implemented through cost share programs. Uh, one of the other wildlife um, programs, is this one is a Southeast Kentucky Early Successional Habitat Program. And this is mainly for counties in Eastern Kentucky because most of their uh, landscape is forested. Um, and these are for landowners that are strictly interested in doing wildlife practices to help enhance their forest. Um, we've had this one going since 2013, which is seven years. Uh, so far we funded 260 contracts. Uh, almost 12,000 acres planned, almost 7,000 acres um, applied, almost 6,000 of that has been forested acres, and a, a plan and almost a little over 3,000 has been applied through forest programs. Um, if you're interested in going through the NRCS um, cost share programs, and like I was saying, the, the for, uh, for, uh, forest land improvement, the edge feathering, patch clear cut, all those are cost shareable practices that are offered through NRCS. Uh, the best thing you can do or the first step is if you don't have a farm number for your property, um, this document shows you how to get that, what all you need to take to the farm service agency so they can get that process started for you. Once you get your farm number established, then you start working with NRCS. Um, this kind of just lays out the steps on how that process will go. We'll set you up a plan, put a plan together. We'll do an application, uh, take care of, care of your eligibility, which is through Farm Service AC. And then the step four, there's a ranking. So we take all the practices you're wanting to do and we put them through a ranking system. And if you rank out high enough, um, then we go through with a cost share contract. And then at that point, we'll offer cost share to help you implement these enhancements to your property. Randall, thank you. I appreciate that. You know, I think um, the, the programs that you work with, the uh, Division of, um, or the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources and NRCS are two really important things. Oh, I know yeah. a lot of woodland owners really own their property with an interest in wildlife. Yeah. And that's how we get a lot into the door to try to do some forest management. And, and I, you know, I just wanted to, as Randall was saying, many of these practices can be compatible for both wildlife and for timber production right, as well. Right. So. Yeah, so please take advantage of these services and opportunities available. If there's any really quick questions for Randall, we'll take that. Otherwise, we'll um, hold all questions to the end. Um, but I'll give you a quick moment if there's just something burning. Um, and otherwise, you can just kind of uh, get the questions to your agent, and then we will um, address those in a little bit. Um, all right, so I think we're going to go ahead and, and keep going then. Um, I'm going to switch over to Mr. Doug McLaren. All right, so now we have Doug in the studio. So Doug, again, thank you for being with us. Um, I, I introduced him a little bit earlier, but I will tell you again, he is the president of the Kentucky Woodland Owners Association. He's also the chairman of the Kentucky Tree Farm Program. And um, I don't know if Doug, if you were gonna tell him, but Doug is also a, um, a retired forester from here. Um, he's one of our um, really strongest extension foresters that we've ever had at the University of Kentucky. So Doug, I'd like to take this uh, public opportunity to thank you for all your service and um, and I'll tell you folks if you think you retire and you stop working this is not the case I mean I've seen Doug do it seems like you're doing even more now than you did when seems you were working way. with us but um, but Doug's you know so we've heard from the Division of Forestry and we've heard from Fish and Wildlife and NRCS so these are some of the government groups that are out there to support right. landowners but certainly you're kind of representing tonight two really important um, kind of landowner base groups for landowners so um, I'm really glad to have you and letting you share um, some information with the audience I, I 
appreciate being here, having the invitation. And uh, yes, it's it's basically the perfect storm, and that is that uh, uh, being the chair and the president of two organizations uh, as far as uh, wood based, and uh, and then having the opportunity of having these speakers coming before me is a real treat. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, as of just a couple days ago, uh, I've been in uh, forestry for 50 years professionally. Wow. So it's, it's been you've, a, you've seen some trees grow up? I, I've seen them grow up, too. It's been interesting. But uh, I certainly appreciate the, uh, the previous uh, speakers that we've had here this evening. Basically, what they've done is they've set the stage for the need of assistance and a better understanding of the topic of forestry for the landowners that are out there. Um, I don't know if uh, we get around to it, but there's like 400,000 private landholders in, uh, in Kentucky. So there's a lot of potential work. Um, nearly half of the state is in woodlands. Uh, so we have a great potential here. And uh, just like it says right there uh, in front of you, uh, 155,000 woodland owners that own 10 acres or more. And so it's uh, very important for us to have the resource people, such as the ones that have just spoken, uh, out there to help us. Um, in the industry itself, in the forest industry, 28,000 people are employed uh, directly in the forest industry in one way or another. And uh, there are uh, 2,800, almost 2,800 master loggers to help make sure that the lands that are being logged and processed out there are being done in the most sustainable way. Um, we have 720 uh, industries out there. Uh, basically, every county has some type of wood industry in it. So uh, if you haven't thought about it, look around in your county and, and, and take a look at the potential wood industries there. And economically, it is a, a, a real pusher as far as economics. Uh, it contributes close to $8 billion um, annually directly in the forest field. And when you start adding all the uh, sidelines on, we're up into the 13 billion total, which uh, competes with a lot of the other industries that we have here in the state of Kentucky. But, and then also uh, wildlife recreation, tourism, and there's so much more that's related to woodlands. Uh, just think of our state park system. It was designed to bring people to look at the uh, recreational opportunities and the woodlands in the different uh, segments of the, uh, the uh, state itself. Um, we're going to talk about two organizations. The first one is the tree farm uh, system. Uh, there is the national um, tree farm uh, website um, if you would like to go and take a look at it. But I'm going to briefly just go through and talk about this. Um, if you own woodlands, 10 acres or more, um, you might need a mentoring system. Trust me, uh, from the speakers that came before me, uh, I know that you heard a lot of jargon. Uh, some of it you may have understood, some of you may not have. So the thing is, is for you to jump into this, you, it's good to have some type of mentoring system. And the two programs I'm gonna speak about are good mentoring programs. The tree farm system is basically for those that have an established management plan as the uh, two speakers previous to me uh, talked about. Um, Basically, uh, we're talking about a community of woodland owners who want to do the right uh, thing. Uh, basically, they want to manage their woodlands in, in the most sustainable way. And uh, so what they have done is, if they are part of the tree farm system, they have uh, gone out there, they have found a forester and other uh, different types of uh, natural resource managers and have helped them develop these plans over the year. Uh, they're woodland owners who uh, work with uh, professionals, uh, be it uh, the professional forester that, that uh, Pam Snyder spoke to you about, or uh, the wildlife expertise that uh, was just mentioned here a, a moment ago. Um, all, of these, all of these resource people are there to help you develop the management plan. One thing you have to understand is you don't have to do it yourself. You do not. Uh, the National Tree Farm Program began in the early 1940s. It actually uh, became established in the western part of the United States. Uh, what was happening was uh, people were having their lands um, harvested 
and they were not uh, being put back into production in a sustainable manner. And the industry saw this and the industry said, you know, in X number of years, we're gonna run out of trees. So they uh, got uh, this recognition program, the National Tree Farm Recognition Program, where people that had that green sign that you see up there in the right-hand corner on their properties, they were doing everything in the right sustainable way so that, it, that the forest would be uh, in part, part, they just keep on going forever and uh, could be harvested in any way, shape, or form. And um, like I said, the green sign up there in the uh, right hand corner, uh, they have demonstrated the desire to manage their properties sustainably. Uh, there's four sides to this sign, and they identify the management of uh, wood, water, wildlife, and recreation. And these are only the highlights of the many diverse opportunities that a woodland owner has available to them. Um, don't think that those are the only four, but those are the main four that uh, the, the National Tree Farm, the Kentucky Tree Farm Program is uh, basically uh, utilizing. Uh, here in the state of Kentucky, there are 650, approximately 650 uh, tree farms. Uh, as you drive along the highways and byways of Kentucky, you may see this sign. And when you do, you can recognize the fact that that landowner of that property is managing their lands in a sustainable manner. And not only uh, this generation, but maybe a previous generation, and it goes on through the family, uh, the legacy program, uh, they continue to do such a thing. Uh, we're gonna switch hats now, or I'm gonna switch a hat. Uh, I, am, I, was, I am the chair of the uh, tree farm program, and I'm the president of the Kentucky Woodland Owners Association. A perfect storm has been <laughs> set here, here, Billy. A perfect storm where I get to be both. And uh, this particular organization, uh, this is the, the mentoring uh, of it. Uh, and this is the organization that you would want to join. If you have a piece of property, like I said, we don't even care if it's one acre or more, uh, but if you have an interest in becoming involved in a much more sustainable manner of your property, the Kentucky Woodland Owners Association is the one that you want to uh, become involved in. Uh, it's an organization based here in Kentucky, and it's concerned for the management and production of their wood, your woodlands in a sustainable way. And uh, many of the woodland owners appreciate the opportunities that are available for education throughout the state, throughout the year, and a hands-on opportunity. Uh, it, it just uh, is a wonderful way to become involved. Um, it's easy to sit at the desk that you're sitting at in the office that you're sitting in and hear all of these opportunities, but the best thing to do is to be out there actually seeing it actually being done in a three-dimensional situation. Um, so uh, let me back up here a second. Um, so, like I said, it's an opportunity to take advantage of educational opportunities throughout the state, throughout the year. And the uh, members of the uh, Kentucky um, Woodland Owners Association enjoys the opportunities to interact with other landowners. Uh, whenever, there's a, whenever there is a forestry training of any uh, aspect and these landowners get together, yes, they listen to uh, the messages being delivered, but also whenever there's a break, they love to get together and talk about and compare their management styles uh, with those of others. And uh, there's, there's many facets of uh, growing timber. Um, I don't think it's what well, probably has been during your webinar mm -hmm. series, but the, the trees in Kentucky are extremely valuable in that uh, we have some of the most valuable species of trees in the world uh, the oaks, the walnuts, the, the cherries, it just goes on and on. And uh, now with the uh, white oak initiative, uh, makes that species even more valuable. So uh, not only uh, the timber crops do these landowners talk about, but again, uh, going back to, to what Ellen said, forest health is an extremely important aspect right now. Uh, being advised as to you know, what our situation has been and where it's going to. Um, it, can, it can lower the quality of a forest in a heartbeat. Uh, the emerald ash borer is a very good situation that uh, showed us that very quickly. Um, the other thing about uh, 
the programs that we attend and provide. Uh, it provides opportunity for you to understand where the markets in forestry are going. Uh, they do change. It's just like any other market, uh, cows, pigs, chickens, uh, there's ups and downs in it. And uh, we are there to help you uh, guide you through those particular situations. And uh, the other thing is, is a identification of potential certification opportunities that arise in uh, forest economics. Uh, with the tree farm program, that was the program we talked about a second ago, uh, it went from a recognition program to a certification program. And eventually, not at this particular point, uh, but we're hoping that the certification will get a, a bigger edge on the price that uh, landowners will see for, the, see for their um, the timber crops that they take off of it. Um, one thing that we as the Kentucky Woodland Owners appreciate, and that is the affiliation with agencies and other organizations throughout the state. Uh, it's an integrated group of people, meaning uh, the different organizations, and we keep in contact with all those organizations so that we understand what is going on at a, uh, you know, in the now time, so that we can pass that on to our, our membership. Um, it's, it's interesting, woodland owners uh, deal with the day-to-day, year-to-year management of their woodlands, and uh, they're constantly interested in whatever is going on there uh, to take uh, an interest in their lands. Both of the organizations, the Kentucky Woodland Owner uh, Organization as well as the Tree Farm Program, these programs are designed to bring the landowner and the professional natural resource manager together. Um, again, don't worry about who does what, what organization does what. Both of them, both of them are mentoring uh, situations, and we simply want to have the opportunity of bringing uh, people together, and that is uh, the resource manager and the landowner themselves, and find out what is best for the sustainability of your forest as well as everyone else's. Mm -hmm. No doubt. Doug, I'd like to thank you also too for or on behalf of the Kentucky Woodland Owners Association. You all help support our Woodland Owner Short Course Series yeah. every year, um, as well as the Kentucky Tree Farm Committee. So some of you all that are sitting out there, and um, hopefully this has whetted your appetite a little bit to learn more. Um, we'll be putting together right now our Kentucky Woodland Owner Short Course. Um, that'll be happening um, this later July and August. We're still working out the details on the dates and the exact locations, um, but that'll be available um, before too long. So it's an opportunity for you to get out um, in the woods and, and meet some of these folks um, that we've seen here tonight and learn about some of these opportunities. So right now what we're going to do is we're going to take a five minute break and then I'm going to bring back in Pam and Randall um, and then you'll have all four of us in here in the room together and um, we'll, we'll open it up for questions at that point. So please be thinking about getting questions to your county extension agent um, that they can get into the chat pod. Um, please try to use the chat pod if you would and we will try to respond to those questions. Questions. So we're going to take about five minutes. So get up, use the restroom real quick, then get back in your seat, um, and then we'll um, try to address these questions. So again, folks, I encourage you to take advantage of this opportunity um, when we've got this expertise um, live with us right now um, here to serve you. So, so Renee, if you can give us a five-minute timer, um, we'll give everybody a few minutes, and then we'll be right back in five minutes. Hello, folks. Um, we're back. I've got the esteemed group here of Doug McLaren, Randall Alcorn, and Pam Snyder. And again, I'm Billy Thomas. Um, we had a few questions come in um, while, while you all were out, um, and we appreciate those. Uh, still use this opportunity to continue to get questions in, and we're going to do our best to address them. Um, Randall, i got a couple that came in. I want to start with you, if you don't mind. Um, one coming from Johnson County. Right. How do you get rid of Tree of Heaven? Um, kind of depends on the size of it from what i've seen um if it's small uh, by the size of a uh, water bottle so to speak and smaller you can cut that off and uh, spray it with uh, i like to use like a triclop here or a mazap uh, as your herbicide those are a little bit more aggressive um so you can just spray the stump when you cut it off if it's bigger than say a pot bottle um then what you want to do is you want to take a, a a hatchet and and make a hatchet mark in it and then spray the herbicide within the cut, but you want to keep about a inch, inch and a half space in between your marks and go all the way around the tree. 
So Brenda, I hope that helped. And again, you know, I don't think there's any um, substitute for getting a forester or wildlife biologist out there on your property talking about some of these things and they can actually show you some of these practices too. So it's a good benefit. Um, and I'll show you a place where we've got a few little videos here in a minute on some of the other resources that we have available. Um, but let's go ahead and try to get another um, question or two in before we do that. Um, so I think we might address this, but there was about um, EQIP applications. States that need to have farm records established with USD service um, center agencies. Can you provide more detail about this requirement? Yes, that farm record, that is your, uh, your farm number that you will get at FSA. Um, so you just go on FSA, you need to take a deed and then a proof of ID. Um, you provide that deed, tell them you want a farm number and then they'll start that working for you. They'll, they'll either bring out a map or take you over to a computer and, and kind of ask you to show where the property is and then they'll draw it out. Um, and then as long as there's no other land tied to that, they'll give you a farm number for that practice. And then at that point, you can use that number to participate in any of the EQIP programs. So hopefully that's clear again, but I think if you just called that office, they would walk you through it yeah. really um, and, and probably address any questions you had there. And, and those that are not familiar with what FSA stands for, it's Farm yeah. Service Agency. It, right. Sorry, I use acronyms. Hey, yeah. well, it's acronyms. <laughs> yeah, we get used to using acronyms all the time, so it could mess us all up a little bit. All right, so it looks like we got another little question about bush honeysuckle in here. This came up a couple of times, and um, you know, Randall, I'm going to turn it over to you again, if you don't mind. I know you've got some real experience dealing with some of this stuff. Yeah, again, uh, the best way to get rid of it, you know, if it's it's over knee high, uh, typically just cut it off and you want to cut it as close as you can to the ground and spray that stump with a uh, herbicide. Again, you want to use, depending on what time of the year it is, you can use just generic uh, glyphosate at a 50-50 rate. Um, but I typically like to go a little bit heavier with a uh, triclopyr or again, a mazapyr. If you use a triclopyr, you want a 50-50 rate, uh, mix that with water. If you use a mazapir, that's pretty pretty strong, and that is soil active, so you want to be careful with that one. Uh, but you can reduce that down to about 12 ounces uh, or six ounces to a like a 32 ounce bottle with water. So now, a triclopyr and a mazapir, those are the active ingredients. Those right? are the active ingredients. So, yeah. the, so when you go, you can ask for those active ingredients, but they're they might be under under different labels or right. other names as well. So. Yeah, uh, Garlon is usually the name brand you hear associated with triclopyr. Uh, and then arsenal, I think, is a mazapir yep. is a common one that you'll hear with that. And then glyphosate is really kind of a Roundup type yep. product yeah. or a cord or rodeo, um, depending on how you use it. So uh, it, the names and stuff can be a little confusing a little bit. But again, I think there's no substitute for getting these foresters and wildlife biologists out there with you. Um, uh, Randall, it looks like we're sticking around with the invasive species. Um, Ellen, I, I think Ellen might have left us, so she's off the hook a little bit here. But um, how about some kudzu? You know, it seems like I'm seeing more and more kudzu every yeah. year, and it seems like it's creeping further north. So the thing with invasive species is it it's not a uh, one-year fix. It's something you have to stay on top of. Um, the idea behind some of these cost share programs is to hopefully get cost share to help you get it to a manageable level to where – you know, once or twice a year, you just need to go over that area and apply herbicide to some foliar um, sprouts. But as far as kudzu, again, you're wanting something that's a broadleaf killer, something a little bit stronger. So again, triclopyr is a good one. Crossbow, um, it's another one. It's triclopyr and 2,4-D mixed. Transline is also a good one. Um, but I think you got to have a applicator's that's license applicator's to, that's to that's order that one. Yeah. yeah. Um, but if you know somebody, I mean, it's a good one. Yeah. Well, you know, and I guess what I would say to that, you know, if you're treating really any invasive species, yep. you know, you want to be that, that to be part of a management plan, right? So you want to have a management plan in place. You want to have a um, kind of a prescription for what to do. And that's where working with a biologist or a forester, they can develop that prescription for you. They'll detail kind of how you're going to treat it. They'll show you how to do that. So again, it's not stuff that you have to know completely all by yourself. Um, there's help um, that will come out and work with you on that. Um, we've got another question. So folks, please keep getting these questions in. We'll stick around as long as you've got questions. Um, I did see one in here earlier about, um, is there a white oak disease going on? And you know, really I'm not aware of any kind of wide scale um, white oak diseases. I think what we're seeing a lot and maybe the questions kind of centered around, we've recently created this thing called a white oak initiative. And this white oak initiative is really drawing attention to the long-term concern for white oak, um, not only here in Kentucky, but throughout its region. What we have in this 
area that's causing us the concern is we have plenty of mature white oak, but what we're not seeing is the smaller babies coming up to replace those. And that has a lot to do with the way we've managed our forest and the way we've harvested the forest in the past. Um, so this white oak initiative is really trying to promote white oak related management, which, you know, from a wildlife standpoint, it's really important, you know, it's one of the favored species um, for wildlife. And it's certainly um, dug one of the most valuable species, yes. you know, from a timber standpoint. Um, it's really important to the bourbon industry here in Kentucky and um, contributes so much to that. So um, again, as far as I know, um, there is no kind of widespread disease on white oak. We always have a little thing here or there. What I would say, if you've got some issues or concerns about white oak, uh, please let your county agent know and they can get a hold of us and we can get the appropriate people out there to kind of take a look. Um, certainly, if if there's something new that you're seeing, um, we want to know about it to try to contain some of those issues. Um, do you have anything to add on that, Dan? Okay. Um, let's see, another kind of question came in. Is crossbow safe to treat kudzu near streams and larger bodies of water? Um, I'm not sure cut, or crossbow's labeled for water, is it? Um, I'm not sure on that. Uh, I think they're, like if you got kudzu maybe growing on stream bank or something, um, you know, you're, you're going to be using it at like a three to 4% solution. Um, but again, you want to read your product label mm -hmm. and make sure um, before you start doing any kind of uh, spraying next to a water body like that, uh, just to be on the safe side. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, every time you buy one of these chemicals or herbicides, it will come with a product label. And, they're, and, and please take a minute to read that. You know, uh, one thing we have to say is the label is the law. Um, and so you have to follow that label. And those labels are in place to protect not only you um, as an applicator, but to protect the environment, non-target um, things as well. So please, when you're applying any herbicides, you wanna make sure that you follow that label. And again, it will come with it. Um, all right, we had a question come up in the Q&A section asking about, is there a place to see how many acres of woodland are there on a county basis? And there is a place, and um, I'm gonna try to pull that up for you real quick here. I'm gonna share my screen. All right. So what I've pulled up here with you is the um, Forest Inventory and Analysis Program. Now, Pam had mentioned earlier that the Division of Forestry goes out and measures plots all across the state. Um, and then they, that data, where does it go and what happens to it? Well, that data is accessible through this website, what I'm showing you right here on your screen. And the way, you, the easiest way that I know to show you how to do that is go to this little tool of validator. And you can click on this validator right here. Um, and then you would just kind of scroll down. Um, and then you would basically enter what you're looking for. So if you're looking area of forest, that could work right there. That's what we're looking for. Um, then we just kind of hit continue. Um, you can hit continue again. And then you want to go to Kentucky, of course. And that'll pull up the Kentucky data. All right. And then you got some options here that you can do if you like. Um, what I will say is to get the county, you're going to need to put that in the row variable there. And then we will scroll down here. And that should be able to generate us a report that shows us how many um, acres there are in Kentucky by county. Um, so you can see total in Kentucky, we've got 12,379,171 um, <laughs> acres, give or take one <laughs> yeah. or two, uh, but it's pretty close. So of course these are estimates, um, the best estimates we have actually. And then as you scroll down there, you can see the various counties and that total column there is how many acres in this estimate. And there's so many other things that you can kind of sort that data on, um, but it's really a good read resource um, if you're interested in finding some of that FIA data, Pam, um, that your folks collect. And I will tell you, we use this FIA data for a lot of planning at purposes, a lot of reporting purposes, and it's really important to kind of monitor how our forests are growing and what's going on with them. So I, I can't thank Pam, you and the Division of Forestry for leading that effort and collecting that data because it's really yeah. critical um, to what we do. All right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna get off of that. I wanted to um, highlight to you um, some additional resources that we have. This is our UK Forestry Extension website, and you can find links to all of these great folks here on our website as well. 
Um, but one thing I wanted to point out, if you, any of y'all are interested, we started a radio show a couple years ago. It's called From the Woods, Kentucky. And on this, we have um, every week, Renee Williams, who's behind the scenes running the, um, the equipment out, outside the studio here, um, is one of the leaders with um, Dr. Laura Lotka on this program. Um, but you can listen to all of the podcasts um, at, at free. And wherever you get your podcasts, you can check this out. Um, and, and you can see all the many different episodes that they have here. And I think they're up to around 60 episodes on a wide variety of different things. Um, so I would just encourage you all, if you want to check out a podcast while you're mowing your grass. Doug, I think you said today you started your weed eater for yep. the first time. Yep. So, uh, <laughs> the season has begun. <laughs> so when you're out there working on your property, um, you can drop in your um, little headphones there and listen to some of these podcasts. Just download them before you go out. So I wanted to point that out to you as well. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out off of our UK Forestry Extension website, I mentioned we had a few other resources. Um, one of that is we've got a bunch of little videos here, um, and I want to show you that right here. And um, we have all, a, a number of different videos in different categories that you can see here. Um, we've got some on tree identification tree identification, um, how you kind of go about that. If you wanted to um, control unwanted plants, there's some treatments on how you do these treatments, kind of a little short um, two, three minute ones. Um, we've also just how you assess the woods and stuff like that. And this is also the place you can find some of our previous webinars that we've done. Um, you can see here that we've got a number of webinars that we've recorded and made available. Um, these are free and you can check them out anytime. Um, that you like. Um, we also have a tremendous number of other resources that are available on our website. Um, so if you're interested in kind of staying up with what's going in in forestry and all of that, um, stay in touch with us. Check out our website frequently. Check with your county extension agent as well. Um, they're usually in the know on what's going on all across the state. So um, I just wanted to highlight a few of those resources and really I've got this pulled up. I thank Renee for doing the work behind the scenes to make this all work so smoothly and um, we really appreciate it. All right, so I'm going to see if we got any more questions. Folks, it, it, this is your time to get some questions in. Um, we will stick around as long as you have some. Um, but if you don't have any, we don't want to keep you. And I certainly don't want to keep some of these folks that have some pretty good drives um, ahead of them. So um, we'll give you just another moment or so, and then I'll close this out. And um, again, thank you all for being with us. So um, this is like your 30 second warning. If you got a question, let your county agent know and we'll get it in. And I guess while we're waiting, I don't know if y'all got any other kind of closing thoughts that you might have, anything that um, I'll, like I'll simply reflect say on? again, the, uh, especially the Kentucky Wheel Owners Association, it is a mentoring system and that is that we can interpret you know, or make those connections right. between the, the professional and, and the landowner themselves. And also I'll make a plug that there's a tri-state uh, forestry program, wildlife program, that's going to be uh, March 28th. 28. It's a Saturday and it's going to be at the Boone County uh, complex yep. there. And uh, you can find it on the website. And you can find here. it on our UK yeah. forestry website. So that's a chance for to most it. people in the northern part of the state. Yeah. All right. Um, so anything else, folks? Okay. All right. So um, please join me out there in thanking them for being with us again. It's I, been a pleasure. I thank each of you all for spending your evening with us and You're trying welcome. to, you know, reach out to folks all across Kentucky. We've got more than 20 offices out there that are um, with folks in there. So um, again, I'd like to thank each of you all for coming out tonight, for spending your time with us. Um, we're certainly very appreciative of that. And um, we're thankful that you um, gave us your confidence um, to come out and try to learn some stuff. Um, take advantage of these resources, folks. There's a lot of people that want to help you do right by your land, and there's a lot of assistance available. So tap into those and um, enjoy your woods, but work with some of these professionals to get the most out of them. Attend some educational events, talk to other woodland owners, and I believe that your woodland ownership experience will be much better um, than it was before. Mm -hmm. All right. So thanks. Thanks again to the county agents. Good thanks night, to everyone. you all, and have a good, safe trip home. <laughs> and um, we, we really appreciate y'all being with us.